please. Uh, we are terribly sorry for the technical difficulties we faced at the moment. Uh, anyway, it's too bad to rely on something that is not natural. Uh, so, I think we have to develop an idea of depending on oneself uh, and on natural things things that do not belong to us, never last long. This is what we're facing. Right. Um, I thank Professor Esgel for such a wonderful and colorful introduction about myself. It's really good to have people like him who speak good things about the speaker. That is what we lack in many places. I'm greatly honored to come and share my view with you today and to speak in front of such a friendly audience. I would like also to thank all of you here for the job you've done in order to get me released from prison. I've heard that most of you had been standing in bad weather in front of the State Department calling for my unconditional release. Thank you for the solidarity you've shown, not only with me, but also with the ideal I stood for, as well as the thousands of Oromo sons and daughters still languishing in Ethiopian prisons. I would like to thank those of you who, stand, who stood by my family and supported them materially, psychologically, and financially when they needed most. It is more than a century now since we fell under the yoke of slavery. Since then, we are not in charge of our own affairs and in control of our resources. Um, we have seen no peace and stability. Our values are destroyed and our identity is being eroded on daily basis. Our fathers have put stiff resistance against the occupying force heroically, but finally overwhelmed by the military might and army superiority supplied by the West. Today I'm not here to educate you about Oromo history or history of the various organizations. In this regard, there is no better authority than you here. So I'm simply here to share with you some of the grave realities the Oromos are in today in the political, cultural, and economic fields. I will also try to mention what I think are the challenges and opportunities ahead of us and to suggest the role we need to play. Um, uh, this machine is still disturbing anyway. Maybe I may need uh, an aid here. Okay, uh, that's okay now. Um, as you may remember, in 2004, if we take only the recent events in Ethiopia, more than 300 Oromo University students were dismissed from a single university, the Sababa University. In 2011, at the height of the Arab Spring, the Ethiopian government panicked and waged war-like campaign and took thousands of Oromos to prison. In 2012, the Biji Oromo protested against the mining company in the area, and about 800 of them were jailed. In 2013, in Kofale, West RC, the people protested against the government's intervention in religious affairs, and several were killed. In 2014, 
11 Romo students were killed with live bullets and other forms of police brutality. In all these killings, the perpetrators have never been brought to justice. These days, you can hardly find a single university where Oromo University students' blood does not shed. And the ritual is usually the month of May, the month in which the existing government came to power 24 years ago. In universities like Jimba, the regular army is permanently stationed in the campus targeting Oromo students. In Mizan Tepe, the federal forces broke into Oromo students' dormitory and attacked them on several occasions. Wolega University is notoriously known for inviting the, and opening its gates at leisure for those who attack students under its own guardianship. It's not uncommon for Oromo mothers to receive bodies of their sons and daughters from universities like Makele, Aromaya, Metawalabu, and others as well. Sadly, the condition of Oromo University students is not any better in universities where the presidents are Oromo themselves. If there are dismissals from any university, there is no doubt about it, about their identity, they are Oromos. In every part of the country, speaking a fun Oromo is enough to render you level a terrorist or OLF member and send you to prison. So federal prisons are filled with Oromo prisoners. In every prison cell you happen to enter, you find Oromo names engraved on the walls. Every record bears Oromo names. The guards shout Oromo names, which they do not pronounce correctly in the middle of the night for investigation. An Oromo who goes to the investigation room and comes back conscious and without help is the luckiest person. The investigation begins with verbal abuses, demoralizing and dehumanizing languages and the soul shifts to an inevitable, an inevitable torture. The type of torture used in Ethiopian prisons does not seem to have much in this modern world. Based on the evidences obtained by force, most Oromos receive sentences as high as life imprisonment or death. Mistreatment of Oromos in all the federal prisons is, is, not, is a norm rather than an exception. Apartheid in all its grace is there. Books written in Oromo are not allowed. Any artifact that your Oromo identity is forbidden. Owning or running small businesses like cafes and tailoring are impossible. Education and vocational training the right to parole or pardon are inaccessible to Oromo prisoners. Oromo prisoners always go to the courts handcuffed and are not entitled to sit in the buses that transport them. Their cases are heard in small inconvenient rooms where family members cannot attend. Medical attention is a rare luxury. Many Oromos died because of lack of appropriate treatment. Nimonat Lahun and Ahmed Nagash are two recent examples. The prison officials refused to hand over the body of Ahmed Nagash or disclose where it rested. Rebi Nagasa and Alamayo Talasa died shortly after their release because of the injuries they sustained during interrogation. The mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of the Sfaun Jamada and amputation of both limbs of Kafalo Ghana are still far from clear. In the last three years, the prison officials in Galiti and Kilinto systematically organized and executed all attack, all out attack against Oromos. In the economic field, 
the situation is no different. The Oromo coffee grower cannot negotiate price or hoard his produce even temporarily. Because of lack of equal opportunity in the business world, Oromo businessmen could not be successful. The scramble for the land, for the Oromo land, the main economic base of our people, has commenced with the regime's seizure of power and reached its climax, especially after the 2005 election, during which Oromo villages were wiped out in an act tantamount to genocide. Around 58,000 of Oromo families have been evicted and their land had been distributed to members of the comprators of the ruling elites in the name of floral industries, development corridors, industrial zones, real estates, and condominium sites. As a result, the beneficiaries are swimming in riches while the indigenous or more are drowning in poverty. They milked our land for all it is worth. And when no land is available any longer, they designed a project to incorporate the surrounding areas in the shining name of the new master plan. The expansion of Infine is not only about money, natural resources, or power, but it was aimed at destroying Oromo homes, families, language, and identity. For the Oromos, it is a war about the survival of their children and culture. Thank you. Um, the expansion of Infine is not only about money, natural resources and power, but it was aimed at destroying Oromo homes, families, language, and identity. For the Oromos, it is a war about the survival of their children and the expansion in the name of investment has continued unabated even after several Oromo University students have been killed in the protest. The mouth of EPRDF leaders is, is still wet with last four wells, and it is clear that they will make determined efforts to seize it. In their venture, the Abyssinian intelligentsia is working hands in glove in designing, defending, and implementing the project. They are actually the ground crew that enables the real pilots to fly high. Uh, that's okay. In all directions of Oromia, eviction of farmers and grabbing of their lands has continued. The Karayu Oromo have lost their land to Awash National Park, the Matahara Sugar Factory, and Awash Agro Industry. Millions of Borona pastoralists have lost access to their dry season grazing land since the flora El Fora started operation. The once dense forests of Guji with their huge gold reserve beneath them are turning into barren land. The Saudi rice exporters have carried out huge deforestation in Bali. The Indians have invaded our land, the Chinese and the Turkish hire our, hire our use for less than a dollar a day. Ladies and gentlemen, our children are being offered inferior education. They are made to study in crowded classes taught by incompetent teachers. Contents that reflect Oromo identity are removed from the curriculum. A fun Oromo clubs are totally banned all in all the schools across Oromia. A fun Oromo has been declared an official language, but the communication in the offices is being conducted in Amharic. More than 60 newspapers magazines, journals, as well as many dozens of community, commercial FM radios, on top of the government's huge mass media network, are working against the Fanoromo unrivaled. Fanoromo is now displaced in areas it used to be spoken only a few years ago. 
All the cinema halls opened in Tumvine and the big cities of Romea. The books were printed, the audios and the videos, the audios and the videos released are working towards that end. A shift from a final remote to Amharic. We are losing our land, we are losing our language, we are losing our identity, we are losing our human dignity. We are a demographic majority that is reduced to political, social and cultural minority. As people, national humiliation has befallen us. In our fight with an evil system, we are faced with tremendous challenges, of which three are worth mentioning. First, the Oromo diaspora and the large portion of Oromos at home don't seem to have faith in peaceful struggle. By citing from history books, they argue that dictators are not at all willing to surrender power peacefully and they ask us whether nonviolent methods have ever been successful anywhere. Their observation is right, and at first glance their argument seems valid. But we must understand that history as news is mainly the record of evil things rather than good ones. War rather than peace, I'm sorry, good ones. War rather than peace, hostility rather than friendship. I'm sorry, I have to, I, I have to say this again. Their observation is right, and at first glance, their argument seems valid. But we must understand that history as news is mainly the record of evil things rather than good words, war rather than peace, hostility rather than friendship. History does not report if neighbors settle their feud through arbitration, but it becomes a morning news headlines if they kill one another, because good news is no news. The fact that there are a number of people in the world today is and the humankind did not perish indicate that the triumph of nonviolent ways of resolving conflict over violent ones. It is true that historians have generally neglected the role of peaceful struggle, but it is clearly a very old phenomenon. This type of struggle has been used to gain national independence to resolve political and economic conflicts, to undermine dictatorships, to gain civil rights, and to resist foreign occupations. Major elements of the 1905 Russian Revolution, the 1908, 1915, and 1919 Chinese boycott of Japanese products, Germans' nonviolent action against the crab push in 1920, the American civil rights nonviolent struggle, the 1920s to 1930s nonviolent struggle of Indians against the British rule are all few examples that indicate the success of nonviolent struggle. In our situation, we must admit that nonviolent method has not been exploited fully and it lacked continuity and support. As Oromos, we have demographic advantage that would give us many benefits and place us in a unique position. In peaceful struggle, we can exert huge pressure as consumers, as professionals, and as producers. As consumers, we can make great impact. A particular com commodity is purchased by millions of Oromos, Oromo buyers every day, and you can imagine what effect it may have if we happen to boycott. 
This is peaceful struggle. As producers, we can make even greater difference. The American Negro in the Montgomery bus boycott forced the bus companies to change their policies. Why are we not able to withhold our coffee, hide, save or wait to get our rights respected and our demands met? Given the large number of almost even servants and professionals, why is it not possible to apply methods like collective disappearances? At present, the government is harassing and intimidating by jailing people, but we can turn this violent action into a favorable nonviolent direct action by seeking imprisonment in hundreds, in thousands, and in millions. If every peaceful resister is committed to going to prison rather than surrender their rights and live in humiliation, how many prisoners, how many prisons will the Ethiopian government be able to construct? Nonviolent method is also cheaper in terms of human and material cost. It is easier to recruit, train, and mobilize supporters. People from all walks of life, from a teenager to the octogenarian, can take part in it. It seems that the days of a peaceful, one peaceful demonstrator echoes louder than the laws of hundreds of soldiers in combat today. Most importantly, peaceful struggle does not have parallel in healing wounds of the past. Unlike violent struggle, it does not result in submission capitulation and defeat of one side, it rather promotes reconciliation and mutual coexistence. Therefore, there is no bitterness in the aftermath of nonviolent struggle. The peace that is achieved through nonviolent struggle is a positive peace and that is sustainable. A nonviolent resistor A nonviolent resistant can fight for his language by sending his children to Oromo medium schools, selling or to selling to or buying from persons speaking in the Oromo language, by writing and reading Oromo literature, by listening to Oromo music or songs, by attending religious services conducted in Oromo, by counting his wage in the Oromo language. I'm raising these few examples to show that nonviolent struggle is not pastime of the powerless and the hopeless, but it is, but if it is creatively and consistently applied, it is the most important, less risky, but effective weapon available to oppress the people like ourselves. There are some that view the EPRDF, the EPRDF regime is invincible, something the Oyanis wants badly and work for incessantly. These people deliberately spread views about the strength of the regime in terms of military capability and security apparatus, that thereby warning the public not to stand up for their rights considerable section of our people have fallen victim to this propaganda and have withdrawn from the struggle. We have a big task of making them believe that political action is a source of power. We have to create an awareness that no evil system has managed to live forever. History and experience has shown us that the when the going go tough, the toughs got going. The world is changing rapidly in favor of oppressed people that it is becoming difficult for dictators to hide their evils, evil deeds from public view and escape with it. The strength of dictatorship is dependent on source of power in the society, which in turn depend on the cooperative cooperation of multitude of institutions and people. It is becoming possible to make people withdraw their cooperation, thereby speeding the eventual downfall of authoritarian regimes. The third challenge, and the one helping the regime to tighten its grip on our people is 
the presence of elite minority that is joining the ruling party. These few intelligentsia have two origins. Those who are unable to withstand the threat and harassment of the regime and those which are tempted by provisions of luxury cars, villas, large states and other fringe benefits by the government. In the so-called 2005 election, a good number, sorry, 2015 election, a good number of PhD holding Oromos have contested on behalf of Obidio and have already declared winner, have already been declared winners, thereby preparing to serve as representatives of the regime among the Oromo rather than representatives of the Oromo in the parliament. It is this elite group that quells popular revolts around Oromia. They legitimize the system by smart presentations using crooked data. The regime presents the lifestyle of these people as models to inspire others. On the other hand, in order to prove their loyalty, these Oromo intellectuals turn more brutal than non-Oromos. The last and the one I consider most worrying challenge we are facing is lack of unity among the Oromo. The Oromo, one of the most important values the Oromo used to be known for was their tokuma, the idea of oneness. We know that during the Milik, the Milik invasion, the various Oromo groups like the RC Oromo, who had better unity, had resisted enemy forces for a long period of time. Unity provides them with strength. In my view, being a majority, why we, are, we have been relegated to a minority status can be partly attributed to lack of unity to defend our rights. As long as we are not united, the status quo may remain the same for quite some time. This is something nobody desires. We have to come back to our much revered value of Takuma, that Oromuma. Before we were Christians or Muslims, we were Oromo. Before we were, we were Shawas, Arsis, or Walagas, we were Oromo. Thank you. <clears throat> Before we were OPDO, OLF, OFC, or ODF members, we were Oromo. <laughs> now, now, let's go back to our Oromumo, that Tokuma again. As I, as I have tried to mention, the Oromo are politically oppressed and marginalized and economically exploited. Our language, culture, and identity is under serious threat. But the situation is not desperate. We have millions who are ready to rally behind, behind us and defend their rights. And we want this to happen peacefully. The objective of our peaceful struggle is not to defeat or humiliate any individual, group, or nation but to gain back what is naturally ours, freedom and <laughs> dignity. Until we achieve this goal, we must join hands and move forward. Every behavior and action of us must be evaluated in terms of its contribution to this end. In spite of the challenges we mentioned above, there are opportunities as well. The first opportunity is the awareness that that has been created among our people. From the so-called 2015 election, it has been clearly learned that our people, especially the young generation, is totally dissatisfied with and dissociated from the existing system. Secondly, it seems that the Oromo in the diaspora has started to view opposition parties within the country as potential allies and began to support substantially. 
The third the most important opportunity is the establishment of the OMN, the Oromo Media Network. The OMN, within one year of its foundation, has been able to penetrate deep into the hearts and minds of the Oromo. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate the OMN on the job well done. Diva OMN. The contributions of OSA over the last three decades have been tremendous. Through its journal, Journal of Oromo Studies, it served as the fundamental source of information and knowledge about the Oromo. It has been regarded as an eye opener as far as Oromo critical consciousness is concerned. As it has been witnessed in this conference, the participation of young researchers, especially ladies, is very encouraging. And in my hope, it is my hope that OSA will continue to help the leaders of Oromo struggle, equipping them with wisdom and maturity the world demands of them. <clears throat> this can be done by providing them with up-to-date research findings that shape appropriate policies benefiting not only the Oromos, but also the entire mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, regardless of all the odds and narrowing of the political landscape within Ethiopia, we are planning to participate in the next local election to be held in two years' time. I'm breaking the news. <laughs> Given the opportunities above, we are optimistic that before the 2020 general election, we will have a strong base in the district and the Kavale levels all over Oromia. By consolidating the experiences we gained from the previous elections, we are going to take EPRDF head on, and we hope that we won't be underdogs anymore. <clears throat> However, we know that it is not going to be easy. We know that it needs huge effort, determination, and, finan and, and finance above all. At this point, while respecting the view of every Oromo, I call upon you to support us in our endeavor to liberate our people from the oppression it is in. Let me reiterate that we are not talking what is impossible. We test it the water. Read my lips, we can make it. Before I choose, before I close my speech, I would like to, to remind you that there is time for everything. And like Ernest Hemingway said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Time has come for us to regain our freedom. Time has come to stop finger pointing at each other. It is time to stop putting blame on the shoulder, on the shoulder of someone else. It is time to encourage our young. It is time to acknowledge the contribution of our elders. It is time to respect our sages. We need history of the past to learn from it, not to incriminate each other. Leaving past, <laughs> leaving past the failures behind us, let us prepare for a new beginning. Besides achieving excellence in whatever jobs we are engaged in, we hope to be champions we are sorry, we have to be champions of democracy, equality, human dignity, and freedom. These are noble causes that require dignified methods of struggle, nonviolent struggle. Finally, I would like to thank OSA for extending this invitation and allowing me to share my views, especially the board chairman and the president who worked tirelessly to get me here.
Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. I think I think uh, our artist Adisa yeah, has uh, present for uh, Obobakala. Adisa, you can come. Thank you. I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I will tell you really quickly about the painting. Um, I was not even intended to paint this until last night. And um, last night I went to uh, Adams Morgan area and I was painting on the canvas and I was not planning to paint you. But it turns out, I think because I was thinking about you and why you're going through in prison, um, it kind of took me to what it is. And I'm trying to paint you in that mindset where you're in prison, and at the same time for um, our honorable brothers and sisters who are in prison right now. 